only being a rookie on the search and rescue, I was deeply disturbed by my findings. I was assigned to the crime scene where I had found a dismembered body abandoned by the side of the road. Nevertheless, I was grateful for any experiences that would help me grow as a wildlife officer, and I knew that this experience would provide excellent training opportunities. The victim's head and limbs were all scattered across several yards from each other. Due to this fact, we were able to determine the animal responsible very easily. Our clues came in our general surroundings. Pieces of clothing or belongings are usually left behind after an attack due to fear of being identified, as in cases with humans as well. The one huge drawback to this was the further we investigated, it didn't match any known killing of any local wildlife we knew. Usually, we were able to identify teeth and bite marks, scratches and claw marks. There might be fur of an actual animal, here that we tested, but not making any sense. Nothing came up as a match in our vast systems. No one could identify the clump of orange-looking matted fur that was left by the victim's head. Worst of the matter, it almost looked as if the head and limbs had been ripped from the body. Not mauled or torn with teeth or claws. Ripped, using brute strength. Now you tell me, what the hell kind of animal would be able to do that? Once the police and medical examiner came, removing the body and any evidence, we were able to further explore the area. Since I was only a rookie, I had to tag along with one of the older guys, and to be honest, I was okay with that. I wasn't sure I was going to get the sight of that body out of my mind for a long time. The boss told him we had to check the area. Until that point... I didn't even know we split the area by letters, and before I could even glean any more information, we were off. I noticed my buddy had made sure the rifle was loaded and ready before we ever headed off. We drove around for a bit, taking the truck through the woods and hiking trail until we got to a far denser part of the parkland that I had never been to before. The ranger just sat there with the engine idling for a bit looking into the trees in front of us, which were way too close together to drive through. It was weird, but I would have sworn there was something like fear in his eyes. This is as far as I go, he told me. Not only because the truck can't get through, but we don't belong out there. Of course, I had to ask what he meant by that. So I asked him, what do you mean don't belong? Rangers can't go. Is it private land? He looked at me and replied real seriously that people can't go in there, and it wasn't just exclusive to rangers. I wanted to ask more, but his silence seemed to imply that that was the end of the conversation, at least for now. And although it seemed to be a real odd thing to say, I didn't think too much of it. Not right then, anyway. We drove back to the ranger station, having scouted the area and not seen anything else suspicious, or indeed anything else at all. There didn't seem to be a deer, rabbit, or even a bird in sight. There was a strange atmosphere back at the station too. Even though I was still quite new, they'd always treated me as a part of the team, keen and eager to take me under their wing, to help me learn the ropes. I'd been told many stories, and most of them had humorous anecdotes about various findings and when they'd done something silly, which they could laugh about after. But this was different. They didn't seem to want to include me. There were lots of looks passed between them, as if there was something they all knew except me, and I couldn't work out what was going on. In the end, still feeling jittery from the gory discovery and the fact that no one seemed to know what the hell kind of creature had caused such devastation. I yelled out. So, what's with all the secret looking stuff not going into the woods? I mean, what do you think is out here? A Bigfoot? A Wendigo? Don't tell me. There's a UFO hotspot, right? The room had gone silent, 
with the boss beckoning over me to his desk. I wasn't sure if I was going to get reprimanded, but he unlocked his drawer and pulled out a map and some various case files. Over the next hour or so, he and the others told me about different incidents they'd attended to over the years. Discoveries that they'd made that either hadn't ended up on the official system, or had been closed with a fake clarification. The category they were really filed under was unexplained. Looking in the files into the photos, a lot of the bodies were in a similar state to the victim I'd found. Head and limbs torn from the torso, but despite numerous bite marks on the body, fur and feces found nearby, they could not match the animal with anything they'd come across before. Of course, even though I'd grown up reading Goosebumps and watching Supernatural, I didn't actually believe in anything unexplained. That notion was ridiculous. It must be some sort of hybrid predator, like a wolf and a cougar had somehow produced offspring. No, the boss had told me. The DNA blood tested at the scene had no similarities with any other animal, except one, he had told me. He pulled out a sheet of paper from the file, and then printout from the blood found today. It was a match, so the same creature had attacked the latest victim and the person in this older file. Maybe all the files. Then I noticed the anomaly. The one creature it had something in common with. Human. So I asked if a person did this. But it couldn't be. If they really thought it was a person, a human being responsible, why were they looking into it and not the police? I mean, why not the FBI, if there were this many blatant cases? But he told me it wasn't a person. And the DNA says it was definitely not a human. But maybe at some point it was. I can't even really explain how that made me feel, or what I was thinking. It did go through my mind that maybe this was some sort of elaborate prank or initiation, that someone would shout, Gotcha! But it never came. Needless to say, the case was closed very fast. I'm guessing the file ended up locked in a drawer, along with the others. For the next few weeks, we all had to double up when we went out especially if it was dark or we were headed off the paths. It kept the camp and trails shut to the public, too. And I still haven't seen a deer or even a rabbit, although the birds seem to be back. There's something out there for sure, but for now, it remains unexplained. My search and rescue experience is not specific to a park rangers, or even one emergency service. I have been fortunate enough to be exposed to many different situations all throughout my short career. The following are quick stories about some of those incidents. I have only been a ranger now for two years, and before that, I spent another five years in the military as an infantryman. All that I know is combat, but working with civilians has taught me valuable lessons on how to take charge. Like how I now wish we had increased the search area on this case a lot sooner and before the weather had changed. It's the weirdest and most frightening experience I've ever had, despite seeing action in the army. Because there's never been a rational explanation for what happened to those women. The three ladies in question were hiking along a well-traveled trail up to Mount Rainier when they went missing. On the fifth day, it started snowing very hard, and there was no sign of them anywhere. One of their boyfriends had called in, claiming the women were all young, fit and healthy, most importantly. Experienced hikers, even if the weather had taken a most unexpected turn. There was no GPS or cell phone activity from any of them, and had it been since the second day. If it had been snowing the entire time, I would have to be more inclined to expect to find three frozen bodies, but the snow had only just begun. Albeit that now, the snow had added to the problem. It should not have been the cause. I headed up to the last place one of them had used a call, and we located the GPS signal, then followed the trail myself 
until I reached their intended finish and rendezvous. There was indeed no sign or anything, the snow now covering any tracks I might have been able to spot. I spent that entire day exploring the area as much as the weather would allow me to, checking above me the whole time. You'd be surprised how many clues there are in the trees that regular people might miss. But no, I couldn't find a thing. It was like those three women just found a hole in the ground and were sucked in. Snow had continued to fall for the next four days solid, and we gave up much hope ever finding them alive. Even if they had managed to crawl into some space that I didn't know existed, they'd have likely have frozen to death by now anyway. On the fourth day, so now nine days since they were supposed to have finished the trail, the weather now grew warmer, and snow began to melt some. So I headed back out, taking one of the dogs with me this time that I had borrowed for the job. See, old Shep was a cadaver dog, trained to sniff out corpses. As I said, I wasn't expecting to find any of those ladies alive. I'm sure you already figured out the story won't have a happy ending. First off, old Shep did find something like what I'd been expecting. A leg. One cleanly amputated left leg. No boot or clothing. Just the leg. A leg that aside from no longer being clothed or attached to its owner was perfectly fine. Not bruised, not gashed, no bite marks. Then we found one of the women, just walking on the trail. I immediately called for an airlift, covering her in warm blankets, giving her fluids. She was still fully dressed in her hiking clothes. No visible cuts, bruises, although you could tell from looking at her. She was in shock, suffering from hypothermia, and appeared to be starving. Her pack and cell were missing, despite me trying to find out if she knew where the others were. She was unable or unwilling to talk. Once at the hospital, they checked over her but couldn't find any physical or long-term injuries or issues. No frostbite, no flesh wounds, nothing. As soon as she was warm, and had eaten. She was asked a ton of questions, but nothing. She spent months in the hospital, just recovering. Having been moved onto the psych ward, pretty early to my knowledge, was barely able to communicate at all, let alone gave an explanation. We never found any more of the second woman, other than that leg, and nothing at all of the third woman, nor their packs or cells or any belongings. It just disappeared. But the scariest part, the part that makes no sense, even less sense than three fit and healthy women going out onto a well-used trail and only one coming back, is that this is not the first occurrence of a group of people just disappearing and only one returning without a scratch or mark on them. But no one has any reasonable explanation as to what could be the cause.